Well, let's open God's Word now to Matthew chapter 19. We've been here the last few weeks. We've been looking at uh, this passage of Scripture, a familiar passage, but one where the Lord Jesus confirms some things that, are, that we need Him to confirm. He, he speaks into some issues that within our culture have been shifting and changing, and, and He gives us an understanding that there are truths founded in His Word, in God's Word, that have not changed. And so in this instance, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, I'll read the text, I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get into today's portion of biblical anthropology, which is an applied anthropology looking specifically at biblical marriage. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 1, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for gathering us this morning for the purpose of being nourished by your word. We have remembered the the love that you've shown to us through Christ. We've seen the gospel displayed in front of us. We've heard it from the testimony of Joshua. We've sung about your gospel love, and, and we've also... Now, looking at your word, we need to know what your word says about how we are supposed to live in this particular cultural moment. And so, would you teach us and would you comfort us? Would you guide us? Would you give us a ground of understanding, a foundation upon which we can build our lives? And that ground being your word and the truth found therein. Would you do this for us? Would you accomplish your purpose in us now as we focus on and study your word? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've pointed out something from this particular conversation that we don't readily see. We know the context has to do with marriage and divorce and what was going on with the Pharisees and how they were, they were taking God's word and twisting it and adding their own rules to it. But, but there's something in this conversation that is glaring for us. It's helpful for us. Conversations like these were very common for Jesus and, and it was, we also know, if you know the New Testament, you know that Jesus was often in trouble. He, was, he got himself in all kinds of trouble, and these conversations bring that out. And, and we, we see that he gets in trouble over and over again with the men of his time, and the reason he gets in trouble is that Jesus was not a man of his time. There were these cultural ideas, these trends, and Jesus wasn't loyal to those new trends. The Pharisees had something of a bully pulpit, but he wasn't loyal to their bully pulpit. He wasn't loyal to the progressive talking points and all the the newfangled ideas that people were trying to put on the scriptures. Jesus was loyal to the ancient truth of God's word. And right here, he goes all the way back to Genesis 2, and he quotes Genesis 2. And this is one of two places in the New Testament that Genesis 2 Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's there's two places in the New Testament where that verse is quoted, right here and then in Ephesians chapter 5. But Jesus is telling us, regardless of what's going on with the times, regardless of what's going on in, in the new cultural moment, he, and therefore we as his followers, are to be loyal to the word of God. Jesus confirms that God's plan for humanity and God's plan for marriage and family hasn't changed. If the Bible is telling us the truth about reality, then we know that much of the popular cultural outlook is just flat out wrong, especially on the topic of marriage. From beginning to end, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, we're reading the story of God and how God relates to the things that he has made, how God relates to his creation. To tell this story, God creates a garden stage. And onto that stage, God creates, forms, fashions a man and a woman. He brings them together as husband and wife at the very beginning of all things in Genesis chapter 2. And this teaches us something. 
God is letting us know by the way that he's telling his story that the foundation of the story that he wants to tell the world has at the very center of it the man and the woman and marriage. Yes, the Bible begins with a wedding, and we just got through studying the Revelation, and you may know that the Bible actually ends with a wedding. Marriage forms this wraparound concept for the whole of Scripture. And yes, there are all kinds of other themes and other ideas that develop along the way, but marriage is a theme that dominates God's story from cover to cover. Marriage tells a story far beyond itself. It shows us something about God's plan for his people. And we're going to learn in Ephesians chapter 5 that there's even a mystery that that marriage holds, a mystery that, that tells a secret about how Satan is going to be defeated and how Christ is going to triumph. And all of this is contained within the concept of biblical marriage as it's revealed to us in Scripture. Now, today we face a barrage of attacks as Bible-believing Christians, and this barrage of attacks come from all kinds of different secular philosophies and, 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 and thoughts and ideas. And nearly every line of the passage that I've been reading for the last three weeks and the passages that Brett taught on for four weeks before that, nearly every line of those passages have been under attack. The fact that God created mankind in a fixed binary of male and female, that is seriously under attack in our culture today. The fact that marriage is between one man and one woman, a husband and a wife, that's been under attack for quite some time as well. The fact that God joins people together in marriage, and therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. The fact that God has joined people together in marriage, whether they worship him or not, that is also a battleground. Because we want to be able to say, no, the state is the one that gets to tell us how this works. Not to mention the mere fundamental truth that God is the creator and we are his creation. All of these truths are under attack and Jesus unflinchingly affirms that his word hasn't changed in any way. So here we are as believers wanting to know, all right, we know what the culture is saying about these things, but what does God's word say about these things? And God tells us some really, really amazing things about marriage. I'm going to point out three today in the time that we have. Number one, marriage was God's idea. What are the implications of that? Marriage was God's idea. Number two, since marriage is God's idea, it only follows that God is the one that gives the right instructions for marriage. That's point number two. And then point number three, we're going to learn something of the mystery of marriage, how marriage points beyond itself to this God-glorifying truth revealed in Jesus. So those are our three points. Let's look first at the fact that marriage is God's idea. And, and you're in Matthew. If, if you want to, just go to the beginning of the book. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I want us to focus in on that, that verse that we read just a moment ago and I mentioned to you. In Genesis chapter 2, and I'm just going to read verses 24 and 25, but let me give you the context in Genesis 1, God has created all that there is, right? We get this, this sweeping overview of creation. God is the one that speaks creation into existence by the word of his power. When, when God speaks, it is so, and God looks upon everything that he has made, and it is good. And then he gets into Genesis chapter 2, and we see, it's like he backs up and he zooms in, not on the, the creation of the whole, but on the creation of the man and the woman. And we've just come through that, and of course I've taught about that for the last couple of weeks, but we just have just come through God creating uh, the woman for the man. He brings Eve to Adam. Adam starts singing a song and celebrating, there's the one that God has made for me, right? All that is in Genesis 2. And then right after Adam sings this song, in verse 23, we, we, we see Adam responding to the fact that God brings his wife to him, and he says, this is my bo last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then we see this statement. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, if you've heard me preach, I, I did the math on this the other day. We have had a lot of weddings this year. Um, I, I think that we've had four weddings already. We had one yesterday, and it was beautiful. 
Uh, but if you've heard me, I, I think I've done like 15 weddings in the last 13 years. It's, it's, it's been really exciting here. I won't even try to count how many babies have been born, but lots of weddings. And if you've heard me preach a, a, a wedding ceremony, a wedding sermon, I don't really change that all that much. And that's intentional. There's, a, there's a, a repetitive liturgical form that I think should follow marriage. But if you've heard me preach a wedding sermon, then you've heard me point this out, that when we read Genesis chapter 2, 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, then you've heard me point out that this is a, there's something interesting about this verse. And the inter- interesting thing about this verse is that there's only two human beings alive at this point, and neither one of them have a father nor a mother to leave. So God is not exposing this truth to Adam and Eve so that they will know what they're supposed to do. He's giving this truth that is supposed to be like a foundational institution upon which all of human society is built. It's not so much for Adam and Eve, it's for the generations to come. This is God's plan for his people. This is God's plan for human flourishing. A man and a woman come together, they leave their father and mother, they create their own new family. This is how society will be built. And we understand that right from the very beginning of Scripture, marriage is God's idea. This verse is here to show God is establishing marriage as the first cultural institution in human history, and it is established before the fall as a gift to mankind. Before there was ever a school or a hospital or a church or a city council or a supreme court, God gave us marriage. Marriage is not a human concept concept, and it's not a social construct. Marriage was given to us not so that we could reshape it in any way we see fit, but so that we could understand that at the center of God's plan for humanity, at the center of God's plan for the world, is this wedding. According to Genesis chapter 2, marriage is an institution established by God and ordained by God at the very beginning of human history and as the foundation for his plan for all the world. And this is incredibly important for us to understand because when we see that marriage is God's idea, not the culture's idea, not politics, not, not any of those things, when we understand that fundamentally this is God's idea, then we will also understand that it is God who establishes the rules that are to govern it. This is a consistent, logical approach that we take as Christians to this issue and so many others. In his book, Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel, Ray Ortland writes this, Marriage is not a human invention. It is a divine revelation. Its design was never part of our own made-up arrangement. It was given to us at the beginning of all things as a bright, shining monument of eternal significance. And we might not always live up to its grandeur, None of us will do so perfectly, but we have no right to redefine it, and we have every reason to revere it. You've probably heard me quote that before. I think it's a powerful statement. Marriage was designed by God as a way for a man and a woman to enter into one intimate relationship that would, in part, allow them to experience the intimacy that each of us truly longs for. It forms this lifelong covenant relationship of intimacy where a husband and wife take away one another's loneliness and enjoy one another in a one flesh union that leads to family. In God's design, marriage leads to family. And as the family grows with the addition of children, we see the rise of human society and human culture. Marriage and family are the ground floor of culture building. Weeks ago, Breck talked about our responsibility to be builders within culture. That's part of what we're doing as we're subduing the earth. That cultural mandate is on us. And at the ground level of that is marriage and the family. They are instrumental to God's plan for spreading his glory throughout the world, which is precisely why marriage and family are always in the crosshairs of our enemy. Now, we're going to talk more next week about the role of biblical family. Today, we're going to focus on marriage, and there's still so much more for us to learn. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that there's this mystery associated with marriage, and it's a mystery that points to the covenant relationship that God desires to have with his people. But in Ephesians 5, Paul also tells us 
some of the instructions for marriage. Since marriage is God's idea, what has God told us about marriage that is going to help us to practically live that out in a way that we can receive the joy that comes from it and God can be glorified in our obedience to him? So let's look at Ephesians 5. And I know I've got you flipping around a little bit, but just go way to the right. Ephesians chapter 5. It's a very familiar passage. It's, it's read quite a bit, especially at weddings and things like that. But at, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul gives us some very clear instructions. In fact, what I think is going on in Ephesians chapter 5 is that the Apostle Paul, where he's, he, he actually quotes Ephi, uh, Genesis 2, but instead of just quoting it, Paul gives us this big exposition. He preaches a sermon on it, if you will. And as you're turning there, I want you to think about something. If you were to ask a dozen couples why they decided to get married, you're to sit down with a young couple or sit down with an older couple and just ask them you know, the question, why did you get married? What led you into marriage? My guess is, and based on my experience, is that you would get a variety of answers to that question. Some people would say, well, we got married because, um, you know, I, I love this person. We were in love with one another, and there's these deep emotions. We just knew that we were meant to be together, and, and be- because of my love or our love for one another, we went forward into marriage. It's a common statement. It's not a bad place to start. Some might say, well, you know, I was getting up in age, and, you know, we were together, and we didn't want to be lonely, so, you know, we got married so that we could just share life together and not be lonely in this world. This world is a very lonely place. Okay, understood. In some rare moments, someone might say, in, in, a, in a moment of honesty, they might say, well, you know what, we were dating and we weren't honoring the Lord. We, we got pregnant and we just thought that the right thing to do was, was to get married. Hopefully, someone might say, well, you know what, we, we pursued marriage because we're, we're following Christ and, and our faith in, in, in God's word helps us to understand that marriage is God's plan for his people and it's a gift to us. And so we pursued it for that purpose. Hopefully, we'd hear some of that, but... How often do you hear that? There's a lot of different reasons why people decide to get married. And and here's the thing. Whatever reason people give for getting married, that reason serves as the the foundation of their marriage. Right? If, If you get married because, well, I just really love this person, have this deep emotional connection with this person. Okay, well, that becomes the foundation for your marriage. And how many times have we heard, well, I just fell out of love with that person. Maybe your emotional state is not a firm enough foundation for marriage to last a lifetime. Or maybe it's some other combination. The question that I'm I'm wanting you to be thinking about is, what is the foundation for marriage? Well, as Christians, we know that the foundation for marriage is our faith, our understanding of what God has revealed to us. And as Christians, we want to fortify Our understanding, we want to fortify that foundation with some very practical instruction. And that's where Ephesians 5 comes in. It's practical instruction for us in how we can build a marriage on on what God has already revealed and to do it in a practical way. So since marriage is God's idea, it only follows that God is the one who gives us instructions for how it's supposed to work. And that's what he does for us here in Ephesians chapter 5. But before he really gets into the details of marriage and what a wife's role is and what a husband's role is, he starts it out in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 by saying this. He says, therefore, and he's talking to believers, he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. He doesn't say, in order to be beloved children, imitate God. I've pointed that out many times over the years. Our understanding of our relationship to God is not that we do all of these things so that God will love us, But because he has loved us through Christ, we want to honor him and obey him and we want to follow him. But what Paul is doing here is he's establishing this understanding of gospel theology in the practical ways we live our lives. He says this, be imitators of God as beloved children, not so that you can become beloved children. And as beloved children, we imitate God by walking in love in the same way that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the umbrella over, over the top of our lives as believers is the gospel that we've 
seen in Christ, the sacrifice of Christ on behalf of his people. And we know the gospel is the good news that Jesus came and he lived the life we couldn't live and he died the death we deserve to die. And he didn't wait for us to clean up our lives. God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul says, this gospel reality, this understanding of grace is to cover everything you do as believers in Christ. So he's, he's giving us this understanding that there is a character to the kingdom of God, and that character looks a lot like Jesus. It looks a lot like sacrificial love and humility. Our identity as Christians is founded upon sacrifice and humility and the submission of Christ to his Father's plan. And, and so here's something that we need to get our minds around. Sacrifice, humility, these are glorious things in the kingdom of God, but they are not very well celebrated within the world, not when it comes to marriage. To God, humility and sacrifice and submission are beautiful, and because we're believers, we've come to understand these things as beautiful too. But the world champions something different. The world champions you do you, which is selfishness. The world champions, if, if he's not doing what you want him to do, girl, you just got to get out of that thing. Selfishness. The world champions pride and rebellion and taking advantage of the situation. But the kingdom of God takes humility and sacrifice and submission and elevates it and says, that's the standard. Does that make sense? The world and the scriptures are upside down by comparison to one another. So this is the backdrop that we have to keep in mind as we read the rest of this chapter because the things that we're called to do for one another must be rightly understood within the context of the character of the kingdom of God. In other words, if we come to this passage with the value system of the world, we'll read Ephesians 5 as though it's regressive or foolish or antiquated. And we won't follow its, its guidelines. But if we allow the gospel to reorient our hearts then we can submit to the calling of Ephesians 5 being deeply dependent upon the values of the kingdom to help us to be faithful to it. So with that little bit of setup, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. And in verse 22 through 24, we see the, the main instruction that Paul gives to the wife within a marriage. He says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, I understand that simply reading verse 22 means that we have just entered into a battle with our culture. The idea of submission there is, is a challenge, especially in, in the the, the power dynamic culture that we live in, many will simply read this and reject it because they see an abuse of power in the mere mention of the word submission. The idea of male headship, which is the consistent posture of biblical marriage, that is viewed by our culture as evil and oppressive on its face. And the cries of the patriarchy aim to, to drown out anything that God might say in terms of instruction about marriage. But the biblical teaching on male headship is not about an abuse of power. It's about taking responsibility. Did y'all hear that? The biblical teaching on male headship is not about power or the abuse of power. It's about taking responsibility. When God gave to Adam and Eve the, the commands in the garden and they sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, to whom did God come first? We know the story, right? I mean, this is Genesis chapter 3. This is the, the third chapter, the third page of the book. When Adam and Eve were given the instruction not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that they eat of it, they would surely die. And then the serpent comes in, and the serpent tempts Eve, and he says, you will not die. You'll be like God. And she said, well, I want to be like God, so I'm going to eat this fruit. When all of that happened, and the Bible tells us that God came into the garden, who did God go to first? Eve was the one who was tempted. Eve was the one who sinned first, and then she gave to Adam. But who did God approach? He approached Adam. He approached the husband. He, he approached the one upon whom he had placed the responsibility to provide and protect and lead. 
And Adam had failed in his responsibility. And that's one of the pictures of headship that we understand from Scripture. Headship is not about power. Headship is about responsibility. God had given Adam a responsibility, and he failed in it, and so God confronted him over it. God calls for the husband in a marriage to bear the weight of the responsibility to love and protect and provide for his family. It doesn't mean that the wife has no responsibility to love or to have some part in provision or protection. It simply means that, the, that God has given the man the primary responsibility there. And that is consistent throughout all of Scripture. Paul's not walking away from that. He's actually enforcing that here. Adam was commanded to guard the garden. We learned a couple of weeks ago. He was, he was commanded to protect his wife, and he failed God called him out on his failure to take responsibility. And this word, this instruction to the wife, this word to submit, it, it means to recognize and respect an ordered structure of responsibility. In other words, it's, it's this. God is telling wives, understand that God has given your husband the, 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 the responsibility to bear the weight of leadership. Recognize that and respect it. That's what he's saying to the wife. For the wife in particular, God calls her to live out the posture of Christ-like submission toward her husband in a way that she does to no other. Never is the husband commanded to subjugate her, nor is the husband commanded to demand this type of submission. Instead, the man's responsibility is to unconditionally love her sacrificially. And the wife's responsibility is to submit to her husband out of her resolve to accept the, the ordered structure and to demonstrate gospel sacrificial love to her husband. And this does not mean that a wife will never disagree with her husband. Amen? This does not mean that a wife's responsibility is to sit in the corner and not say anything, not do anything. This does not give men uh, the, the responsibility to treat wives like doormats. That's just called sin. That's not biblical Christianity. That's just plain old sin. And, and women will speak up. They will offer and must offer their wisdom and their guidance and their concerns. Why? Because you think for yourself. You're a child of God yourself. So no, this doesn't mean that you should sit in the corner and not speak. This means you should engage and you should step up and you should help your husband to see every decision from your point of view. Let your gifts and your feminine beauty and grace flood into the relationship. But... At the end of the day, you understand that God has placed upon your husband the responsibility to joyfully lead. And he has placed upon you the responsibility to joyfully respect and submit to that. A wise husband, by the way, will seek this from his wife. Will seek out her guidance. Will seek out her instruction. Will seek out her wisdom. A wise husband doesn't turn away from that, but he will seek it. And then when his wife gives that to him, he should praise her for it. Notice in verse 22 where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That phrase, as to the Lord, is really important. This means that a wife's submission is not ultimately to her husband, but it is to Christ. Christ-like respect from a wife is an act of faithfulness to God, and a wise husband will receive it and cherish it, and will not take it for, for granted, nor take advantage of it, but will allow it to increase his love for his wife. And speaking of a husband's responsibility to love his wife, here's the primary responsibility that a Christian husband has as a way to express the gospel love to his wife. Look at verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, granted, there's, there's a lot more that we could say about all of these passages, all of these phrases. We're just doing a, an overview here. But the wife's responsibility, the particular way that she shows gospel love to her husband is through her respectful submission. And the way that a, a Christian husband displays gospel love to his wife is that he he extends to her over and over again this sacrificial desire to love her. This sacrificial expression of love for her. 
The Greek word here is agape, and that's what it means. It means sacrifice. It means love that is sacrificial in nature. And in some cases, it means to love someone else more than you love yourself. Actually, no, that's what it always means. And the greatest example of agape love, of this kind of sacrificial love that husbands are being called to, the greatest example of this is Christ himself. And who, What did Christ do? He, he gave up his life to save sinners like you and me while we were still sinners. We were rebels against him, shaking our fist at God in every sin that we committed, in every sinful word that we uttered, in every sinful desire that is in our hearts. And yet, he displays an unconditional, sacrificial love for us. And that's what we as husbands are called to do for our wives. By the way, unconditional, it means unconditional. It doesn't mean that you love her sacrificially if she learns how to respect you well. It means you love her sacrificially no matter what. This is a heavy calling. Christ gives us the example. He lived for us. He died for us. Jesus paid the price. He, he paid it all. All to him we owe. Right? You know the old song? And in response to his gospel love for us, we are to love our wives sacrificially. This is the example of sacrificial love that Christian husbands are to follow. But there's more. Look at verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes. Those two words, nourish and cherish, they're important. They're instructive for us as husbands. The word nourish means to develop. It means to lift up. Uh, Paul uses the same word in Ephesians 6 when he talks about the, the parent's responsibility to nurture their children. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up, nurture them, grow them, help them to flourish in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And the idea is that our love for our wives and our children as husbands is going to help them grow and flourish in the world. You can think about it this way. Our, lo our love serves like a trellis. And our wives and our children are the vine, and we provide the structure and stability so that their, their lives can flourish in beauty and growth. That's what we're called to do for our wives and our, and our children. A loving husband cares more deeply for his wife than he cares for himself. He sacrifices his own desires to show her love, to make her feel love, to increase her sense of security and safety. He serves to help her grow in her love for God and her love for others. And this type of love is something that will help her grow as a woman of God, as a child of God. It will nourish her. The word cherish, well, we know what that word means. And every, every wife wants to be cherished by her husband. To cherish something is this deeply emotional attachment. It's this idea, it has the idea of heartwarming there's this longing, this loving desire to show our wives that we cherish them in such a way that they feel loved more than anyone else in the world. And when a woman is loved in this way, she knows that she is cherished by her husband. She feels secure in the relationship. She's not looking over her shoulder to see if there's some woman behind her that her husband is attracted to. She knows that she has his eye. Men, you do the opposite of this. You do the opposite of nourishing and cherishing your wife when you don't allow them to know that you have eyes for them and them only. When you're being attracted to other things or other women or you're giving your eyes to something that isn't yours, you're not nourishing them and helping them to flourish. You're doing the opposite. And a loving husband should never live in such a way that his wife has to wonder do I have his heart? Do I have his eyes? Is he thinking of me? Part of our nourishing them and cherishing them is doing our best as husbands so that they never have to ask that question. Husbands, make sure that your wife knows that you cherish her and her alone. Okay, I want to say much more, but practically speaking, this passage teaches us two things, one that relates to the wife and one that relates to the husband. A wife has one overarching relational need from her husband, and that is love. Physical and emotional and spiritual and protective and intimate love. 
And a husband has one ultimate relational need from his wife, and that is respect. Perceived, stated, applied, displayed, respect. Both of these things are presented as unconditional responses from the other, which means I'm not waiting around to love my wife sacrificially until she shows me an appropriate level of respect, and vice versa. This is what we're called to do by God. This is our service to the Lord in our marriage to our spouses. And I want to end this section with what I think is a really powerful quote from Ray Ortland. I mentioned something from Ray early on, but he says this, and it's an instruction for the husband as well as an instruction for the wife. He says this, for the husband, understand that in our broken world of today, deep in the heart of every wife is the self-doubt that wonders, do I please him? Am I the one he dreamed of and longed for? Will he love me to the end? Am I safe with this man I married? Will he cast me off? Even if, he goes, if we go the distance, will he get tired of me? And a wise husband will understand that uncertainty. That question is way down deep in his wife's heart. And he will spend his life speaking into it, gently and tenderly communicating to her in many ways, darling, you are the one I want. I cherish you. I rejoice over you as no other. The thought of living without you is horrible to me. I love the thought of growing old together with you, hand in hand, all the way. I will hold you close to my heart until my dying day. A wise husband prizes and praises his wife above all others. And that is why the word love is in verse 33, because love breathes life into a woman. I generally share these quotes when I'm doing premarital counseling because I just think they're incredibly powerful and good reminders. So some of you have heard this before. But what about for the wife? Wife. What about for the wife? For the wife, remember that God made Adam first and put him in the garden with a job to do, a mission to fulfill, and a mountain to climb. But now, in our broken world of today, deep in the heart of every man is the self-doubt that wonders, am I man enough to meet the challenge that God has called me to? Can I fulfill my destiny? Won't I just end up failing? Is there even any point in trying? That question is way down deep in the heart of every husband. And a wise wife will understand that, and she will spend her life speaking into it, communicating to her husband in many ways, Honey, I believe in you. I know that you can follow God's call by God's grace and for God's glory. The Lord is with you, and so am I. So let's go for it. A wise wife will never put her husband down or laugh at him, but will greatly strengthen him and build him up for God's glory, and he will accomplish more by the power of her respect than he ever could on his own. And that's why the word respect appears in verse 33, because respect breathes life into a man. And I see all the men nodding their heads. And just a minute ago, I saw just about all the women nodding their heads. God knows us deeply. God made us. He knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. And he knows what we most desperately need from one another. And he has written that into his word so that we can get the instruction we need so that we can have, as much as we are able, a healthy, Christ-honoring, God-glorifying marriage. But that's not all. We've only looked at two things. We've looked at the fact that marriage was God's idea. And we've looked at just briefly some instruction for, for marriage But what about this last thing, the mystery of marriage? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31, Paul quotes Genesis 2, like I mentioned. He says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says this, This mystery is profound. The mystery that he's referring to, this one flesh union, the the two becoming one as as God's intention for marriage. In other words, the mystery of marriage is this. It refers to Christ and the church. You want to know why we as Christians care so much about marriage not being sullied and corrupted in our culture? Because it points to Christ and the church. Marriage tells a story that relates to Christ and the church in a way that nothing else does. There's no other point in the scriptures where we see that there's this mystery and it's all directing our attention to God's gospel love and redemptive love through Christ. Only marriage is said to do this. The mystery of marriage is that it points to the gospel. And the gospel helps us to understand marriage in a way that we really couldn't prior to Christ's cross. Let me see if I can just briefly summarize 
the connection. Marriage tells the story of two people who were once separated from one another, living their lives in different ways, but in the providence of God, they've been drawn together into this relationship of intimacy and love that is to last a lifetime. That's marriage for us. But what does the gospel tell us? The gospel tells us the story of God and man separated from one another because of sin, but Jesus Christ has come laid down his life on the cross to draw us into a relationship with God, a relationship that is based on grace and mercy, and it's a relationship that's supposed to last a lifetime. One of these things is pointing to the other. That's Paul's point. Like a husband, Jesus Christ pursued his bride and won her. By his, his death, he makes us pure and spotless and free from the guilt of sin. And he has promised to never forsake us, he has promised to never leave us. He has promised to love us forever. And he has promised that in eternity, everything that he has, he's going to give to us. We're going to be co-heirs with Jesus. The, the wedding of a man to his wife is meant to point beyond itself to this story of redemption that God is telling in the world through his son. The marriage of a man to his wife is a reflection of Christ's relationship to the church. And because of this, we value marriage tremendously. The Bible begins with a garden wedding between Adam and Eve, and God is presiding over that wedding. It's a, it's a garden chapel, and it's a beautiful thing. And God says at the end of the day, it is very good. Well, the Bible ends with a wedding between Christ, the perfect groom, and his bride, the church, redeemed from sin by the sacrifice of Christ himself. Marriage may seem very common to us, and it definitely seems common to our culture. Because our culture just wants to redefine it, reshape it, redo it any way they see fit. But according to Scripture, marriage is a beautiful foundation. It's a foundational institution that is supposed to tell the greatest story that's ever been told. Now, I'm going to close with just some encouragement. Perhaps your marriage isn't what you dreamed it would be. Every time people walk down the aisle and they look in each other's eyes, they're all thinking wonderful, happy things. Like, we're going to live the rest of our lives together. This is going to be great. And sin gets in the way, and things don't go exactly like you planned. Maybe your marriage is not what you dreamt it would be. Perhaps the foundation of your marriage isn't as strong as it needs to be. But there is hope. Just in the same way that Jesus lives the righteous life that we can never live and he dies in our place so that he could redeem us from our brokenness to put us back together and conform us to the image of Christ, he can do the same thing for your marriage. Now maybe you need to go back to that foundation and you need to chisel what was there out and you need to replace it with a biblical understanding because it's only that that I think is going to help us to not just make it in marriage but to enjoy marriage the way God intends us to enjoy marriage. Maybe you don't know what that looks like. We have men and women, faithful men and women of God, counselors and teachers who would love to help you with that. I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking that everyone has a perfect marriage but you. That's just not the case. We're all broken people, and we all need God's grace, and we need help more often than we're willing to admit. And if you're in that place, find an elder. Come talk to me. Maybe there's a trusted man or woman that you can go to to seek the kind of help you need to not only put the right foundation under your marriage, but also to fortify it with God's word. Let me pray for us. Father, I do thank you for your word and what it does, what it teaches us. And, and I understand, we understand that when we study these things, this puts us in the crosshairs of our culture in a very, very real way. And maybe there are people here, I'm, I'm certain that that's true, that there are people in this room, who have, have been taught marriage from a very different perspective than what has been explained today. Lord, I pray that you would speak through your word, that you would use your truth and your word to confront us in those areas where our understanding is out of joint. And I pray that you would inject truth into, the, into our lives and into our relationships. I pray for those who are hurting in their marriage right now that they will have someone or, or at least feel comfortable and safe enough to go and talk or come and talk to an elder or someone in the church that they can say, hey, look, I need help. I'm struggling here. Lord, I do pray that we would be the kind of church where it's okay to be broken, but that we would be able to offer help and encouragement and truth. So Lord, let us, let us respond in the way that we need to in whatever way that you're confronting us and convicting us. Lord, help us to respond 
in, in a way that would honor you and in a way that would help us to get the help we need from you and from your people. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gospel and the hope that it gives us. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Please sing.